Thanks for joining us. I'm Alex Bell, and this is To The Point. Survivors of fires caused by PG&E years ago are still demanding the money that they're owed. And we're talking about tens of thousands of people. PG&E exited bankruptcy two years ago, but survivors got their settlement through a complicated new trust fund. And it is causing major delays in payment. And some people have been pushing the bankruptcy court to provide more transparency. And now, as our Brendan, Brandon Riddiman explains, one survivor is formally asking the federal bankruptcy judge who oversaw the entire case to step down. It's devastating. I'm tired of being here. I'm tired. Eula and her daughter Renee have lived like this for seven years in camping trailers side by side where their house once stood. The house burned down in the Butte fire started by PG&E in 2015. I mean, how much more can you screw us over? Like, I mean, my God. Seven years, no place to get the family together, much less to expand it. Okay, my daughter's been wanting to have a baby. And in her mind, how can she even think about having a baby? Live it this way, you know what I mean? Oh. I just want PG&E to pay us our money. I want to get on with my life. I'm 65, I want to move on. They're not the only ones. We've met survivors from multiple PG&E fires who live like this. This outcome was unjust. That is clear and inefficient as well. Stanford business professor Anat Admati says the scheme to pay victims through a trust fund using shares of PG&E stock, that allowed everyone else to come out ahead of the victims. That's not good governance. It's important to understand financial incentives or disincentives that are affecting victims. That's what motivated Will Abrams to call for bankruptcy judge Dennis Montali to step aside. Montali handled PG&E's first bankruptcy back in the early 2000s energy crisis and its second bankruptcy after Will's house burned down in the 2017 Tubbs fire and PG&E's crimes that destroyed paradise. Will's not a lawyer, but he's been active in the case, trying to get details about the victim's trust and the financial interests of the people involved with it. All of those motions to create more transparency within the case have been denied. Will's formal motion accuses Judge Montali of failing to disclose a longtime relationship with a pair of fire victims who he gave special rights in the bankruptcy, rights to reject their settlement offers, given to just five out of the nearly 70,000 fire victims. Will found evidence that two of them had prior relationships with the judge, hosting Judge Montali for a delightful evening of wine tasting a decade earlier. We asked Judge Montali to comment. His staff said he can't comment on a pending case. I am very concerned about how victims have been treated within this case and the amount of critical information that has been kept away from them so that other parties can advance their own financial interests. PG&E's settlement is taking so long, Eula and Renee have one friend who didn't live to see it. He died in the hospital. He didn't get his money. On paper, PG&E no longer owes these people. It discharged its fire damages to the trust fund. But the victims see this as PG&E's mess to clean up. And if she wants to see how messy it is, CEO Patty Poppy has an open invitation to sleep one night here. Come here, come here. The yeah, guests, they were you, are more, okay. you are more than welcome. Come here, Patty. Now, pg and PR folks have repeatedly told us the company's working to make it right and make it safe. But the fact is, pg and &E started back up paying dividends to some of its investors, and it resumed donating millions of corporate dollars to California politicians from both parties this year. Meantime, as you just saw, the worst off victims of pg and fires are living hand to mouth, and they've watched the company spark more big fires year after year. That's not the reason that the bankruptcy judge is being asked to step down, but it is the ground he's standing on and the reality, Alex, of the deal that he has overseen. And has anyone gotten paid the money they're owed? Not fire victims. Some parties have. We're talking about, uh, you know, the bigger claim holders, you know, insurance companies, um, subrogation claim holders. There are all these parties that got paid 100% cash, 
plus interest, but the victims were forced into this trust fund. And because it was paid partly in shares of PG&E stock that haven't been sold yet, it doesn't have the cash to pay out any of the claims in full. So some have gotten some money, uh, a lot have gotten some money, but nobody's been paid outright. And what's wild to me is that these people that are owed money, they have to hope the company does well and stock prices go up in order to get paid. Yeah, up in Calaveras County in that Butte fire, I, talk, I talked to a woman who was like, I have to root for them to do well and I don't want them to do well. But that is the reality because the victims became essentially one fourth owners of the stock in PG&E. And the price has recovered some. It wasn't worth the dollar amount that victims were told their settlement was worth when PG&E got out of bankruptcy two years ago, it's recovered to a lot closer than that. But the reality is if you go on the market and you just dump millions of shares, you get a supply and demand effect and it tanks the stock price. So there was really no way that this deal was going to get the victims paid quickly. These shares have to be sold over time. All right, Brandon, thank you so much. As always, we really appreciate it. And this isn't the end of the conversation. You can catch more of Brandon Riddiman's reporting tonight on our ABC 10 Roku and Amazon Fire app. You can watch Secrets of the Campfire revealed starting at 8 p.m. And then after that at 9 p.m., tune in for more than bailout, also created by our Fire, Fire Power Money team. And then you can catch this show to the point again. And then join Chris and Laura at 11 for late news tonight. And after the break, honoring LGBTQ victims of violence, the latest on the shooting at a Colorado gay club and what violence against this community looks like here at home. Community activists gathered in downtown Sacramento yesterday to leave flowers and messages of love on a community altar dedicated to members of the LGBTQ community who have lost their lives to violence. And the event honoring Transgender Day of Remembrance happened just hours after a man killed five people and injured 18 others at a gay nightclub in Colorado Springs. Two of those killed were transgender. Organizers of the event in Sacramento say the shooting is a painful reminder of the dangers the LGBTQ community face, but they refuse to let it change their lives. And not let situations like this deter you from living and walking in your truth. This is what society wants us to feel is fear, and we are not fearful, we are fearless. So here's where we stand with things right now in regards to the shooting. The man suspected to be the killer is the grandson of California State Assembly member Randy Vopel. He has not commented publicly on the shooting, and the suspect used a legally purchased rifle. Investigators are still looking into the shooter's motive and whether or not he will be charged for a hate crime. And here in California, reported hate crimes related to sexual orientation bias jumped overall by nearly 48% in 2021. There were 162 reported anti-gay attacks in 2021, sorry, 2020. Last year, that jumped to 211. The same goes for reported anti-lesbian attacks from 18 in 2020 to 27 in 2021. And anti-homosexual attacks rose from 21 in 2020 to 61 in 2021. The amount of reported anti-transgender attacks in California actually fell about 30% from 2020 to 2021. But it is important to note that the latest data from the Justice Department shows a 41% jump in hate crimes against transgender people nationwide. Last year, was the deadliest year on record for transgender people. At least 57 trans and gender non-conforming people were violently killed in 2021. We'll be right back after this. Well, today I went through some of your recycling. Yes, you at home. Where do I even start? I saw jeans, printers, coffee makers, an insane amount of plastics. So before you put your wrapping paper in a plastic bag, I ask you, take a moment and think, is this recyclable? Because as we head into the holidays, there's going to be a lot more trash and a lot more people who have to sort it. Oh, it doesn't stink as much as I had anticipated. Nope, (laughs) nope, this is right here. This This is material from all the election stuff. Oh, this is all election material? Recycling, the true test of who can follow directions. It's illegal to put e-waste in the system and they bag it up 
then we gotta fight it. This is the devil. <laughs> don't bag Just your recyclables. Don't bag it. Over in North Highlands at Recycling Industries, it doesn't take long to see how many people don't follow directions. Now, I've only been doing this for about two, three minutes. And just look at all the plastic that we've gotten out in just two or three minutes alone. So just remember, if you're putting stuff in your trash can that shouldn't be there, someone has to get it out. And this place does it for us. The other devils are rigid wood. wood. Uh, wood's not part of any curbside recycle plant. There's no, no one's taking wood. And no one's taking your pair of pants either. Okay, just so drop them off at Goodwill. Your pair of pants. Just drop them off at Goodwill. This, your pants and your clothes and your towels don't go in the recycle bin. We're not allowed to take toys uh, that are fabric-y, but we can take plastic, big plastic toys. Mm -hmm. But fabric-y, clothy, mm -hmm. electronic yeah. stuff, yeah. it's not supposed to. We get people putting toasters in, and toasters are electronic. Anything electronic that plugs into a wall or batteries, um, it's not supposed to, you're not supposed to put it in there. Like no coffee in. makers, Come no. On guys. What, what are we doing here in Scott County? Come on. Nope. So these are the trucks that are coming in the neighborhoods and stuff, right? Correct. These are the trucks that come in the residential area, pick it up from the house, dump it, bring it back. And about how many tons are you guys moving a day? A day? We're about 150 to 200 tons a day of, of this. That's what we do. We process all this and we have to, use a lot of equipment to separate bottles, cans, cardboard, paper, um, and garbage. We can't let the garbage go through. And that's where hand-to-hand -hand combat comes in, says David. That's just today. So you can't do anything with that. That gets landfill. Landfill, that's it? Yeah, that's, but we have to pull it out by hand. All this is by hand. All that's by hand. That's why, that's the, that's the tough spot up there for now. We're still 30% garbage in the bin. It's right now, it's 30% garbage. 30% garbage in the recycling bin? Yes. yes. Is that high? That's pretty high. Some jurisdictions are very rare getting into the tens, but uh, in this region, I've tested everything. It's 30%. What your Christmas wish is My when it comes wish. to your recycling Christmas My wish. My Christmas wish would be no more bagged material don't put your wrapping paper in a plastic bag. That's number bag. one. I want to see that on the graphic there. <laughs> that. Number two, no more plastic, loose plastic uh, film or anything like that. And, and then number three would be no more e-waste. No more e-waste. No more electronic waste. Don't put waste. your batteries in the recycling. And, and then four would be no more wood. My real question is, do I have a job? You are Am hired. I hired? Well, if I'm not here, you know where I'm at. And I just want to say, David really puts his money where his mouth is. Look at his business card, if you can see this. It's a little mini card. It says half the paper, half the waste. So, you know, he means business. Uh, David, thanks for having us. We really appreciated it. All right, on to our next story here. Uh, the month of November is Native American Heritage Month, ABC 10. We are recognizing the history, the culture, and contributions of indigenous people. And drumming is a big part of Native culture. And tonight, as Candace Red explains, it's used to create much more than music. As a Native American. The drum beat represents our heartbeat and, you know, our connection with Mother Earth. Joaquin Rojas says drums are sacred. <laughs> Rojas, who lives in Sacramento, says he's been drumming and singing for more than 20 years. I've been singing since I was five years old. It's the only life that I know. Rojas is a member of a Native group called the Red Hoop Singers. Together, they teach Native communities the importance of respecting the drum through songs handed down from generation to generation. 
We use our drum for everything in our community. If we're able to sing for our community, we're there. Part of being a singer in our culture is a responsibility of to show up when we're needed, to be there when we're needed, and when we're called on to always share our songs. Roja says Native drums are treated like elders, held in the highest regard. We wouldn't leave our elders out in the cold without a blanket. We wouldn't leave our elders alone. You know, we to carry our drum with us, we keep it warm. Indigenous people have been using drums for centuries in ceremonies, celebrations, and spiritual gatherings to communicate with tribal ancestors. Drums are also used to help heal the sick and vulnerable. When we're hitting that drum, again, we're, we're making that heartbeat. And when we're singing, we're lifting those prayers. We're lifting our positive thoughts, our energy to who needs it. Long before we ever had Western medicine, our music and our dance is what used to heal our people. For Stoney Dodson, it's the center of our people. The drum is a connection to native identity. To know it, to be, become closer to it, I think is to also become closer to our people and our culture and our ways. Dodson, who's also a Red Hoop member, says he learned about drumming as a child during native ceremonies. Took my first steps at the, in the, in the powwow arena. Uh, I could dance before I could walk. I could sing before I could talk. Dodson says drumming also saved his life. It's been there for me in times where I needed something to heal me. I needed something to turn to that was positive. There are all sorts of native drums, like hand, powwow, sweat, and water, each with a specific size and purpose. There are hand drums that are used for a ceremony called round dance. Uh, there's big powwow drums where a large number of people will be sitting around the drum. And then there are small handheld drums that we use for sweat. Water drums are, are used in peyote meetings that are uh, that happen a lot in the southwest regions. Both Dodson and Rojas say the drum continues to be a cultural lifeline for Native people and their communities. It always feels good in healing, not just for what the drum does for us, but for what the people around us, you know, does for us and what it continues to do. It gives us an outlet for the youth, especially being in a city like Sacramento. There's a lot of kids who are growing up urban. Maybe they're not close to where their culture was at, but having a drum in the community gives them an outlet to express their culture, to express their identity and to get in touch with who they are. A community drum is now at the Sacramento Native American Health Center, and the center welcomed the large powwow drum Saturday night with a special ceremony filled with traditional Native dancing, singing, and food. And coming up tomorrow into The Point, the first of a two-part series, Tribal Traditions and the Battle Over Cultural Burning in Northern California. Tomorrow, meteorologist Carly Gomez is taking us to Siskiyou County, where the deadly Slater fire destroyed hundreds of structures just two years ago. The flames impacted the Karuk tribe, a tribe that has been trying to use fire to manage their land, help their ecosystem, and keep their community safe. Climate change has created this, this disaster waiting to happen. And so unless we do something, we are proactive about that, we're gonna to continue to have these kinds of disasters. Um, and people's lives are gonna be lost. How Native people have managed the landscape and what should change. Don't miss tribal traditions. The burning battle tomorrow at 6.30, right here onto the point. All right, let's take a look outside at our Gilmore backyard. Whew, Thanksgiving's just right around the corner. This temperature's staying nice and cool. Sacramento at 48, Modesto 50, Tahoe seeing 30 degrees. And a quick check of your 10-day forecast for the holiday weekend coming up. Black Friday, just days away. We want to take some time to support small businesses right here in our area. Bright Ideas Furniture and Home Accents on Power in Road is LGBTQ plus and veteran owned. The store sells hard to find goods crafted by artisans from all over the world, including Vietnam, Guatemala and India. The business is part of a fair trade organization which connects vendors and artists while making sure artists receive fair pay and safe working conditions. What I love to do when people come into the stores, I love when I see them looking at a product is to tell them the story because all of these unique items have a story. It feels really good when you can give a gift and it's helping other people out and it it, it serves a purpose. It's helping the environment. I think that's what people are really getting into this season. And on Black Friday, the store will be open later from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. First time shoppers at the store will be able to get $5 off a $25 purchase. 
And if you're getting ready to throw away your stuff for Black Friday, don't forget, recycle for David. Do it for David. Make sure that you help the good people over at Recycle Industries get everything organized. Make sure you're doing your part to make sure we're making this place a better world. All right. Thanks, guys, so much. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.